Um, I, it's a pleasure for me to be here and to be moderating with these titans. As you can tell, they are thoughtful people. Um, and what's most important about today's discussion is that uh, you're going to get to see something that we often don't experience when we're on television, which is a thoughtful debate um, where people are not shouting or trying to own the other person, but really trying to present a viewpoint in a passioned way, um, but in a, in a forceful way, but certainly in a way that where you're listening to the other person, responding to the other person, whether or not you change your perspective of that. And I think that's the importance of why uh, the Steamboat Institute has brought this, this debate here to Washington and Lee tonight. Um, it's because uh, we, we recognize that very often self-censorship is holding back academics as well as students, where you feel like you can't share, op openly share your opinion without being judged, without frankly being canceled in some situations. And when you consider that academic freedom, the purpose of being here is for you to actually interact with people who don't have, are not a carbon, carbon copy of you, who didn't grow up in the same place, who didn't have the same experiences, but can certainly have some value from their life lived experiences that can change and shape your perspective. That should be happening. And unfortunately, we're not seeing that. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I've moderated several uh, debates on campuses like this before, hosted by the Steamboat Institute. And I love that students come up afterwards and say, you know, actually now I can understand how to do a civil debate and maybe take this back to my class. Maybe feel empowered to speak up when I would rather cower in the corner. And that's, I think, the value. The second piece I think you're gonna walk away from today is just you're gonna hear something that you have not heard before. Um, whether you are uh, in the affirmative camp or the disagreement camp, it's gonna be interesting to see whether or not you, sh you, you change your perspective based on what you've heard tonight. But again, the point is not about owning the debate. It's about presenting the viewpoints, and then you decide for yourself whether, based on what you've heard, um, there's a side that really resonates with you. So the topic of DEI in general, is it's, it's a hot topic. The SCOTUS decision, obviously, is, is a huge piece of it. But also, in corporate America, discussions about DEI are, are very hot as well. Um, there is definitely an interest in whether or not DEI needs to continue in corporate America or how it continues in corporate America. And kind of, and I do some research on this and to give a little bit of background, you know, in, from 2020 to 2021, according to LinkedIn, which is the leading employment website, um, the number of diversity and inclusion officers grew by 169% from 2020 to 2021. I think you can figure out what happened in 2020 to, to spark that. In 2022, we have seen an incredible reversal of that, where now the number of these roles has declined, actually, by 4.5%. And increasingly, you're seeing in the, in the private sector, uh, DEI roles start to disappear. So while we're talking about the academic setting here in college campuses, obviously, we can't talk about that with also, without also talking about how DEI affects the workplace, because I think the discussion around affirmative action and everything else we'll get into tonight has an impact in the workplace as well. So, without any further ado, I'm going to ask Dr. Swain to go and, uh, and pre present her uh, affirmative uh, uh, position. And again, the question is, or the, the, the position is, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives do more harm than good in higher education and should be abolished. First of all, I want to thank you all for being here. And for the VMI students, I was your inaugural, inaugural uh, convocation speaker in 2012. And I had a great uh, experience. And I also spoke at WNL. And I was born and raised in rural Virginia, so um, Chalmersburg in particular. So I'm back home. And I, um, before I get into my remarks here, let's see how do I advance this here? OK, my position here that diversity, equity, and inclusion programs should be dismantled because they do more harm than good. And I argue that the funds that are currently being used to fund these programs can be used in other areas where they will have a greater impact. At the same time that I'm saying this, I'm not saying that I don't think it's important for institutions to be diverse. I would argue that you can have diversity without discrimination. The reasons why I think that DEI programs should be abolished is that 
first, they're not needed to achieve diverse student, faculty, and staff populations. And I base that on the fact that before there was affirmative action, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, affirmative action first came into being as an executive order in the 1960s before the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The 1964 Civil Rights Act prohibited discrimination. And I would say that that act made it possible and it encouraged people to go out and to recruit, to advertise jobs, and to really uh, seek equal opportunities for all persons. And people like me, who came from poverty and were able to get an education, I would say we benefited from non-discrimination, from equal opportunity, from outreach. Affirmative action was never, ever the law of the land. It was never passed by both houses of Congress and signed by a president. It was a series of executive orders that started with John F. Kennedy, then Lyndon Johnson had one, and then Richard Nixon, a Republican, he gave us quotas. The DEI programs are costly and they're overstaffed. And I want to give you some numbers on that. As far as uh, the positions, universities that rank high with DEI faculty leading the way are universities such as University of Michigan, University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, and University of Mich Michigan has 163 DEI personnel. Uh, University of Virginia has 94. Virginia Tech has 83. And in these particular cases, a study that I draw on for this, for my position, shows that the ratio of um, DEI personnel to faculty, because the purpose of a university really is to educate people. It should be instruction. It should not be social engineering. But the university departments are overstaffed. And if you see that graph at the top, you see at the, at the very top is private colleges and universities, how the cost of education has risen. And at the bottom are, is public colleges and universities. And that is over a 10 year period that we, we have gotten the rising cost to the point that it is. And the bottom graph has to do with the ratio between instructional staff and administration. And that's over a 10 year per period between 2010 uh, and I believe 2021. And what you see there is that the amount of money that schools are spending on academic programs, that has dropped. It's been pretty much the same with administrative costs. And so DEI programs, are costly, they're overstaffed because not only do you have the deans, the vice provosts, and various positions like that, they have huge staffs, and then you have departments that are identity-based departments. And so you have uh, scores of people there that are supposed to bring about diversity, equity, inclusion, but if you look at the data, there's not a lot of evidence that it actually works very well that it's doing anything that uh, would not happen if you just practice non-discrimination, outreach, and um, recruitment. And I guess the biggest argument and the one that I make and the reason why I wrote my book, The Adversity of Diversity, is that for the same reasons that the US Supreme Court struck down race-based uh, college admissions, the DEI programs violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And that is pretty serious. And I would say the First Amendment, in cases where 
you have situations where maybe DEI training involves compelling people to do something that they don't want to do. If you are compelled to wear a particular t-shirt or to celebrate a, a particular day for some identity group, that is compelled speech. That is a violation of the First Amendment. And with the 14th Amendment, it violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution that protects all persons. Uh, DEI programs can create conflict and disunity, especially when faculty and students and various people feel as if they're being forced to do things that violate their consciences, then that creates um, uh, situations of discomfort and it also silences students. And I contend that you cannot get an education unless you are exposed to divergent viewpoints. And if you are being educated in an environment where it's heavy on indoctrination, you can absorb and you can regurgitate, but you're not being educated. And the studies show that DEI programs do not create greater student satisfaction, whether it's among the majority group or minority students. And for the minority students, they may have high expectations, but it's not creating uh, the greater satisfaction with campus life. And I'm basing my um, position on you know, several studies that I have looked at. So that's something that if you're gonna have DEI programs, and they take up billions of dollars, and we're talking about just hundreds of positions, uh, then the programs need to justify their existence. They need to show that they are bringing something that would not otherwise be there. And I argue uh, that it's not clear that they are bringing about the diversity that they say that they uh, are bringing about, but what they are doing is when colleges and universities fill out forms to show how diverse they are, they have positions like uh, University of Michigan, they have 163 DEI personnel. These are mostly racial and ethnic minorities, if not all, that gets counted as part of the campus diversity. And so these individuals have to find work to do and sometimes the work that they seem to be doing is creating more conflict. And I argue that instead of DEI, we should institute and practice non-discrimination, civil discourse as we're trying to do tonight, viewpoint tolerance, and free speech. And we can have diversity without discrimination. We can uh, reallocate the millions of dollars spent on DEI programs to other areas such as student admissions or, um, or student affairs. We can increase outreach and recruitment by trying to expand the pool of qualified students. And we can give student groups equal access to campus resources. That's not always happening. And we should prohibit, in my opinion, segregated student spaces on campus because the purpose of you all coming together in diversity is to learn from one another. If you have segregated spaces, you're not learning from one another. If you have segregated courses, you're not learning and you um, are cheating yourself and you're wasting your parents' tuition dollars. We need to end the speech codes and restrictions and, uh, and embrace e pluribus unum out of many one. And so college and universities must respect our civil rights laws and if we do that, I believe that we will have better leaders in the future. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm going to, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm not that sophisticated. I'm going to. Uh, sit. Uh, two years ago, I attempted to diversify uh, a basketball court by being the only person over 40 playing. Uh, one Achilles rupture later, 
uh, it's very difficult for me to stand. So um, for an extended period of time, so I'm going to sit for that reason as well. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming here. You all could be doing lots of other things. You could be watching the Phillies, hopefully beat the Atlanta Braves. You could be, you know, all right, I knew I was in the minority when I saw that poll. <laughs> but baseball minority too? Come on, we're going to win the World Series. Um, and uh, I'm grateful for the invitation. Uh, I sort of referenced the poll, and I know that I am in the political minority here, which is fine. I worked at Fox News on the visiting team for a long time. Uh, and I've always enjoyed, as you talked about, good civil debate. And I'm so honored and proud to be next to you to have this conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. The resolution is an interesting one. It takes two issues up, though, right? So really, if I were to say I, oppose the, I could be opposing it on one ground, that it should be abolished, or I could be opposing it on the claim that it does more harm than good, I oppose both. I disagree with the idea that DEI does more harm than good, and I also disagree with the conclusion that's been attached to it, which is that these programs should be abolished. And I'm going to explain, hopefully, why I take that position on both issues. The first question here is, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's important that we frame and define the terms properly. Oftentimes, both in public speech, popular media, and sadly, even in Congress, the conversation about DEI gets conflated with intellectual and moral panics about critical race theory. It gets confused with book bans. It gets confused even with the affirmative action uh, decision as the exclusive kind of uh, 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 extension or reflection of our respective dispositions on DEI or our collective disposition on DEI. And I'm saying that those are different issues. The reason why I support DEI and the reason why I believe that it does more harm than good, more good than harm, more. <laughs> yes, th thank you for coming. I've been convinced. Um, the, the reason why I believe that it does more good than it does harm is for several reasons. One, when we talk about diversity, I believe that it's important for us to, to frame and define diversity properly. Too often, particularly within the United States context, we reduce diversity to the black-white racial paradigm. In other words, diversity just becomes secret agent talk for race. We want to diversify the staff, means bring more black people in. When in fact, diversity in its true form should be complicated. We should diversify our conceptions of diversity. When we talk about diversity, we should absolutely be talking about racial diversity. There should be racial diversity in the boardroom, racial diversity in the hospital, racial diversity in the classroom. But diversity should also be geographic. It should also be religious. It should also be intellectual. It should also be ideological. And there's nothing about DEI as such that opposes that type of diversity. To your point, we should be able to come into a college campus and have a range of opinions, to be able to say something that's unpopular. You may not know this about me. I occasionally say things that upset people. And I should be able to do that without fear of cancellation. That's part of what diversity is. The problem is, because we've, because we've reduced diversity to a racial conversation, and we engage that conversation within a nation that has deep racial wounds and deep racial divisions, and those wounds get pricked and those divisions get expanded every time we have national crises, every time we have a spectacle of violence, every time we have a, a political election, we, we get more divided, and therefore the conversation about diversity gets smuggled into, or rather the conversation about race gets smuggled into a conversation about diversity. But I'm saying, if we thought about diversity in a broader sense, we may not even be as opposed, as opposed to this resolution as we would be otherwise. The other thing I think we need to think about when we talk about diversity is not thinking about diversity as an act of largesse, as an act of intellectual, moral, political, or economic philanthropy. Too often when we talk about diversifying a faculty or diversifying a workforce, we think about it as a proverbial hookup for the people that are getting added to the mix. 
In other words, diversifying a student body might mean adding more black people and therefore diversity is helping black people. We need to add economic diversity so we're doing a favor to poor people. But studies show that diversity is an inherent institutional benefit. In other words, we all benefit from diversity. I thought about your, your remarks even. You know, we, we all have, there's a value in us being in a room where we have different opinions and exchanges of opinion. But we can't have that exchange of opinions if we don't have diversity. Again, expand diversity beyond just thinking about this as racial diversity. We can talk about race, I'm gonna talk about race. But diversity in and of itself is an institutional benefit. There are studies that show that homogeneous groups, there are studies that show that homogeneous groups, groups that are of the same sort, arrive at solutions to problems more quickly. It's like if you're hanging out with your friends and you all say, what are we gonna do for lunch? Oh, we want Thai, we always eat Thai, fine. We we'll all get tired, right? It's not that hard when you're with your crew to, to figure out what you want for lunch. Heterogeneous groups, groups that, are, that contain people of, a, of different sorts take a little longer, but their outcomes are more creative. They're more dynamic. They're more, they, we, we arrive at different types of possibilities when groups are diverse. It's like when you hang out with new people or you're trying to impress somebody on a date. Oh, well, you know, yeah, yeah, I, I love Korean food. Oh, I, I love Aboriginal Australian food. You've never had it before, right? But you're willing to try now because you're in a diverse space and there's something new at stake. As an institution, we need that. Imagine how much more complicated and interesting our Supreme Court would be, not just if it had more black people, but if it had more people who didn't just go to Harvard and Yale. That's diversity. So institutional diversity is valuable. Imagine how, how much better our universities would be if all the professors didn't come from the same region, or didn't have the same ideological position. What if, what would Columbia University, where my daughter attends, or what would Berkeley look like if there were more conservatives there? What would Oral Roberts look like if I were there? Just a thought. The diversity matters. And we have to begin to embrace it, again, as an institutional benefit for everyone. Now, some would say, well, that's fine as long as you earn your way there. We don't have a problem with black people being in the school. They just need to have the same credentials as the white people in the school. We don't mind women being in science as long as women earn their way into science. They shouldn't get an extra bonus. They shouldn't get an extra point on their application because they are that thick. We don't want unqualified people. You get no disagreement from me. I have no desire to have unqualified. Time really moves faster when you talk. Um, I have no desire to have unqualified people in position. When I go to a doctor for heart, I, after my, uh, what do you think, Achilles, affects the brain too. Well, after my Achilles rupture, I got deep vein thrombosis. I got a pulmonary embolism, I almost died. And when they rushed me, I was literally on the floor, passed out alone in my bathroom. When they rushed me to the hospital, I can promise you, I had no desire to ensure that the pulmonary staff was racially diverse. I had no desire to figure out if the person got a lower MCAT score, but they're really, 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 really important representations of Detroit or Utah, wherever. I just wanted the best doctor I could get. However, the point of diversity, equity, and inclusion is not to include unqualified people. It is to say that among the group of people who are already qualified, we want to make sure that there's some diversity among them so that when I go to the doctor, they don't assume that I can absorb more pain because I'm black, which is something that studies have shown hospitals tend to do. They assume women can absorb more pain, that black women can absorb more pain. My pain score needs to be an eight to get the same medicine that a white person needs to be at a five. These are documented facts. Now, how do you do that? Well, one way is to get black people in there, but that's not enough. I don't want to live in a world where I, the only way for me to get, get good medical treatment is for a black person to see me. I also want white people to be educated through training to understand cultural difference so that we can have a white person who can teach me and a black person who can teach me and who can heal me and can lead me. People of all races, religions should be able to do that, but we need diversity, equity, and inclusion to do so. I agree that it's often inefficient. I agree that it's often excessive. I agree that some people do a bad job of implementation, but that is not an argument for getting rid of DEI. That's an argument for doing it better. So I don't want to abolish it. I want to fix it. Thank you.
So you've now just heard both positions. We're going to give each person two minutes for a rebuttal. And then I have some moderated questions. And then I will turn to the audience questions. And do remember, if you have questions, please submit them. I'm getting them right here. I'm reading them. They are very good. OK, Dr. Swain. OK, my position is not to the equity and inclusion is a black, white issue, because we know it includes the LGBT population, Asian groups, Hispanic groups, women's groups, and almost endless, and even some white studies groups, white, white studies in the way as black studies, but those are really rooted in critical race theory to uh, abolish whiteness. And so the DEI uh, programs on campuses, there are numerous units that are very costly. And we can have, again, I, I, can, I say that we can have diversity without discrimination. And the viewpoint of diversity is something that most colleges and universities have not really valued. Um, probably something like 96% of the faculty at most colleges and universities are Democrats. It may be different here. And as far as the preliminary poll that was put up, I think that you all see that DEI doesn't really work. And I would argue that diversity, equity, and inclusion doesn't mean diversity in the way that it meant it uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's about now people keeping their group identities. And inclusion is not the same as integration. Integration is people coming in, becoming part of the whole, becoming part of the team. Uh, that's not what's happening. And equal opportunity, what allowed me to rise, that's not the same as equity. Equity is about equal outcomes. And I think that we have lost sight of what's really important and the quota systems they've had at universities. And, and um, it's not working. And the DEI infrastructure is not supporting students better than just having support at the colleges and universities in other traditional departments? Two, two points, and, and, and I appreciate that, Claire. And, and my point about it being black, white wasn't necessarily about your position. I think your position is more sophisticated than that. I think the public response to DEI and diversity often is only thinking about racial diversity. Like people aren't marching down the street protesting geographic diversity. They're thinking about race, they're thinking sometimes about gender. And I think that that's something that we need to complicate. Um, in terms of people sort of staying within their group and not integrating, I think DEI initiatives are both and, not either or, which is a kind of framework out of black studies, ironically. Um, and that is to say, we need to integrate and weave people into institutions, but we also have to acknowledge that institutions are often not safe spaces. Um, and people do need legitimate protection from harm in the short term. For example, trans students are often unsafe on students. They're subjected to various forms of violence and hate. Jewish students are subjected to various forms of hate. I would never tell Jewish students that they don't need a Jewish uh, dormitory. That's not to say that I don't think they should be in every dormitory. Of course they should be. I wouldn't tell black people they shouldn't have a blacks only dormitory, but they shouldn't be forced to be in a blacks only dormitory. And if white people want to go to the black dormitory, I think we should create space for that too. But having one that is centered on protecting Groups that need protection, I think, is a different uh, is, is a different issue, and I think it's one that we that we have to take seriously. I I, I and I would say the same thing about area studies. Um, there's a historically, when we take a literature course, not a black literature course, just a literature course, it's still racially centered. It's just a European literature course. Not anymore. Well, because of the EI initiatives. That's the that's the that's the. I, I, I got you. I got you. Just let me, I'm, I'm going to add 10 seconds for that. Um, <laughs> um, I, 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 I think the point is that universities, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly that we should scrap DEI and just do other legitimate diversity initiatives if we could have a good faith, reasonable expectation that universities could do that. But nothing in history has shown that when left to their own devices, universities are welcoming to women a welcoming to Jewish people, a welcoming to black people in the ways that they are uh, people of different racial and ethnic and, and religious categories. And that's why we have to have special initiatives to protect them. 
your, uh, your last point there, Dr. Hill. Please call um, me Mark. Okay. Uh, well, I just want to be respectful. Oh, I appreciate it. I prefer Mark. Okay. Um, but I think, and I listened to um, an interview, maybe it was an interview or speech you gave recent, not too long ago, where you talked about, I did my homework, where you talked about, um, you know, DEI initiatives and how they play out on campuses when you're, when you're talking about creating these spaces or these environments that are welcoming to people. Um, but how, 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 is there a fine line between uh, creating spaces versus uh, virtue signaling, um, or creating environments where, in in essence, you're 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 trying to create a safe space for one person. At the uh, unfortunately, you're trampling on the rights of another person. So how do, how how is it that these DEI initiatives are able to balance them? Because there may there are plenty of people who would say that they don't. That in fact they trample over rights. Um, and, and still, they're just virtue signaling and don't even get to the, uh, the point that they're supposed to create. Well, I, I'm going to begin with my conclusion, which would be, even if I were to concede that point, that would be an argument, again, for doing it better, not getting rid of it, right? If, if, if the mechanism itself has the capacity to, to, to yield a, a, a good outcome, but in practice, it isn't yielding that outcome consistently, our first move shouldn't be to get rid of it. It should be to figure out how to do it, but I mean, imagine, imagine like, imagine like making the first seatbelt. And it's like, you know what, this isn't so good. We're still, got, like our death rate is still really, really high and saying, you know what, we just, let's, seat belts don't work. Let's just hold our kids again. Like, no, you work on it, you develop it, you reframe it, you engineer it, you get better. Now, at some point you could say, this just doesn't work, we need a new technology. And I'm not against in the abstract the idea that there could be something better than DEI in the distant future. But to, to begin at this juncture in history with the point that they do more harm than good, I think is untrue, both empirically and I would say at the philosophical level, I would disagree with you as well. So I, could, I just couldn't begin there. And I certainly wouldn't, because of that, I couldn't possibly say, let's abolish it. Now, so now this, the other piece of your question, though, is, is there a line between doing something because it actually has a legitimate impact and doing something as a virtue signal. Absolutely. And much of what we saw from 2000 until now has been virtue signaling. I agree wholeheartedly. Forbes magazine did a piece uh, maybe eight months ago. A lot of the corporations that made huge donations, oh no, I'm sorry, huge pledges. I'm sorry, what did I say? You said 2000, you meant 2020. I meant 2020. Post George Floyd. Yeah, post George Floyd, forgive me. 2020, post 2020, after the George Floyd nationwide protests, companies said, we're going to the Black Lives Matter. No, we think they matter even more. Here's 5 million, here's 10 million. They were like carnival barkers, right? Throwing out money to show how uh, committed they were to black lives. And then when people stopped looking, they stopped donating. And many of those companies haven't fulfilled their pledges. They didn't have a commitment to black lives or DEI. They had a commitment to looking like they did. I agree, but again, that's not an argument for them not donating, it's an argument for having mechanisms of oversight to make sure that they do it properly. And so for me, yes, I don't want to be in a university where we just virtue signal. I want to be in a university where we actually do something that matters. And then finally, uh, your question is, how do you do it in a way that doesn't trample on the rights of others? This is the part where some of y'all who may have been saying, oh, that's not so bad, are going to be like, oh, no, I still don't like that. Um, if you are in a position of power, then sometimes equity or equality, or democracy, or justice, may feel like oppression. In other words, if I'm a man, and I'm the chair of the engineering department, and shocker, everybody in my engineering department uh, is a man, and suddenly we hire a woman as an assistant professor, the first thing they say is, oh my god, women are taking over the department. There's one, bro, just one. But the moment we do that, we lose our minds. And suddenly it's like, well, a guy can't get a fair shot. There was a guy whose application went in and he didn't even get a shot. And he had two PhDs and, or he wrote seven refereed articles instead of, instead of six. And we start losing our minds. My point is, yes, there might be people who might feel like their rights are being trampled on, right? And I'm not delegitimizing their experience. But what I would say is, we're not starting from a neutral space. That's a historical response to groups, cohorts, uh, of, of not just race, gender, religion, all these things, who have felt like that structurally. They've always felt like the place it has trampled on their rights. Dr. Swain, get in here. So much that you've said that needs to be corrected. And one of the things that 
we didn't have time to get into it because it's not part of the debate question, is uh, how neo-Marxism undergirds much of what's taken place on college campuses when it comes to the cancel culture, the safe spaces, the trigger warnings, the microaggressions. And, um, and so th the college campus itself, I would argue as someone who taught for 28 years, that it has moved further and further away from a place that used to be, you know, theoretically a marketplace of ideas to become an, an indoctrination center. And when you talk about um, uh, the DEI, the DEI is an explosion that's relatively recent. If you look back, uh, there have been many successful blacks throughout history. Harvard University never discriminated against blacks. In 1869, they admitted their first black student. W.E.B. Du Bois got his PhD there in 1933, I believe, or 1930. And throughout, um, America's history, the colleges and universities that did not discriminate against blacks had black alumni. And so, um, and the blacks that have been successful, they have been successful for a variety of reasons. And the civil rights movement was not fought for lowered standards, it was fought to end discrimination. We passed the Civil Rights Act that prohibited discrimination. And what we've done is sort of reinstituted it. We started with affirmative action. That was reverse di discrimination from the very beginning. White people tolerated that. And it reached the point when DEI came along, I would argue that that was a layer on top of affirmative action that people were already struggling with. And then you had critical race theory saying that all whites are oppressors and all minorities are victims. And uh, it became too much. And I, um, you know, I, I supported the Supreme Court's elimination of, of race-based affirmative action, and I knew and firmly believed that DEI has to go because it violates the Constitution, the Equal Protection Clause, and there's a better way. And, uh, and that the better way is non-discrimination, again, the equal opportunity, the outreach. We're not a perfect nation, but I would argue that we were making great strides until the last until 2008. Can, can I rebut that? Because I, there's, there's, I, I have a few corrections to that. My, 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 my question might actually okay. open the door for those corrections because I think you started talking about the differences between the nomenclature here, diversity, which is all encompassing, but diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think very often they're, they're all tied together and considered just about race, but equity is a, is a newer term in our, in our nomenclature, I think, today. People are talking much more about it. And that's the difference between equality and equity. I'd love for you guys to tease out that difference, because I think that's what we're getting at when you talk about different outcomes. Yeah. And how do you get at different outcomes? You're getting at it through different procedures. And that's where the DEI initiatives come into play. So maybe that's an open door for where you wanted to go. Yeah, I, I can make it so we can pretend like I'm, yeah. The, <laughs> I, Equality and equity are important distinctions to be made, to your, to your point. E equity operates from a presumption that we don't all, all start from the same place, right? If, if, if I were to treat all of you equally, what might that mean, right? I just told you I, I, I have a challenge standing for a long period of time. So what if you all were grading this debate and part of how you graded it was by stage presence? Right? Suddenly, I'm already entering the conversation from a different perspective. Right? If, if one of the measures is how well I stood at that podium, I'm just saying for example, I'm, I'm making this up at the moment, but the point is, is that if the measures themselves don't take into account our respective circumstances, we're going to have a, di a, a different situation. It's, and it's not just in my short-term life or my immediate experience, it's also historically. So you say, for example, Harvard has never discriminated against black people. No, they, I would say that that Harvard has not discriminated against white people. They discriminated maybe against Jews. Black people, you mean? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we've Black both people. done it now. We. <laughs> um, well, so I, I would say, and I'm not saying this to correct you. To, so, fa to no, just let me just let me finish. This well, part. let me finish the part about Harvard. So. Well, no, no, I, I, it's, it, it's, I, I don't want to get cut off with my time. I want to I, I want to make the point, and then I want to hear your response. I'm genuinely eager to hear your response. My point about is like W.E.B. Du Bois, who you said is the he's the first black person to get his PhD from Harvard. You're right. Before he was at Harvard, he was at where? Berlin. 
uh, where he studied under Max Weber. He wasn't permitted to fi finish his PhD there. Race, he goes to Harvard. Harvard says, well, you got to get another degree before you can do it. Remember, he, he had to go to Fisk before he went to Harvard. Universities do that for everyone, to everyone. They, they don't actually. They don't give you a degree because of what you did at another school. No, no, you, I, you, you missed something. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm, I just want to finish the complete okay, thought and then hear right. your, your response. When he went to Harvard, they said to him that your, de your degree from Fisk is an insufficient degree, and therefore, you must do another degree in addition to this degree. And David Levin Lewis talks about in his Nobel Prize winning, Pulitzer Prize winning biography on, on Du Bois, so you can fact check me. Um, so his, his, his degree didn't count, right? In fact, Levin Lewis says uh, Harvard was to Fisk what, what uh, Berlin was to Harvard. Um, first point. Second, Du Bois' own account says he experienced deep racism at Harvard. After getting a PhD from Harvard, he couldn't teach at a white institution. So he, he experienced it both in Harvard, and it wasn't in 19, and the reason I'm making this distinction is because it wasn't 1930, it was, it was, the, it was the end of the 19th century, right? He, he, his dissertation, which was in 1896, I believe, suppression of Af African slave trade, was at a moment where he had a major intervention but couldn't get it received properly because of race. But it's not just that. The, it, the, the bigger point here is that the institution, by all documents, has always been exclusionary to, to race and to Jewish people and to women. There's a reason why there's a Wellesley. There's a reason why there's a Barnard. It's because the, the institutions wouldn't let women in. So they've been exclusionary to lots of people, and those legacies don't stop. But it's not just the university. And that's the point I'm making, right? It's not just the university. The medical establishment has always presumed inferiority. Right, the, 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 the psychological establishment. I mean, think about draptomania, right? The, con the, the medical establishment decided that black people had a mental illness if they were escaping plantations because they had an obsession with fleeing, right? The medical establishment decided that black women's bodies could withstand more pain, right? So, so they were subjected to different types of experiments. Um, we, could, we could go on down the list. Um, uh, uh, standardized testing, right? The, the, the early standardized testing was part, of, was part of a eugenics project. And so all of our major institutions have presumed inferiority of women, of blacks, of, of anybody who's non-white, which at the time meant Irish, it meant Italians, it meant Jews. All of this was part of the mix. And so that didn't magically go away in 1964. Even if people's goodwill changed, even if people wanted to have those people in the institutions, the problem is their objective measures have never actually been objective. And that's why we need mechanisms now to oversee that. Now, you might say that was 1964, it's changed. I agree, we've made extraordinary progress in this country. Anybody who tells you this country hasn't gotten better is lying to you. We've gotten way better, way smarter, more, more inclusive, more fair, more just, but we're not there yet, and that's where DEI comes in. Okay, so even if, and I would agree with what you said about women, because women were covered in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, a sex, religion, and then later we know that uh, Americans with disabilities were added to that. We became equal under the law in the 1960s because we passed three major Civil Rights Acts. Of course, that could not change people's individual prejudices because that's part of the hearts and minds, but we did make great strides and equal opportunity meant that doors were open for groups and individuals who had been excluded. And sometimes you, you had to be three times as better, but <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you had an equal opportunity to succeed or to fail. Their question that I had That's about- That's right? I had to be three times as better, but I have an equal no, opportunity. I mean, can you imagine that? The can you imagine telling me I gotta have a, a, a 90% free throw shoot percentage to, to make the all-star team and you only need a 33% percentage to say we have equal opportunity? All I know is that if I go draw on my personal experience as having been a high school dropout, teen mom, I had an eighth grade education, I got a high school equivalency, and I graduated magna cum laude from Ronald College, working full-time at Virginia Western for people that know these places. I worked hard um, and I would say that I had an equal opportunity still to succeed or to fail. They opened the doors. All I wanted was the doors to be open. I think equity, the way we are practicing it, it is sometimes putting people in situations where they're really not prepared, where they are going to fail. Give or me they, an example. I mean, the, the, the data on the students, the, the minority students that go to Harvard, 
and some of the Ivy League schools. The they're at the bottom of they're at the bottom of the class. What's the, dropout, I, what's the dropout rate of black students at Harvard? I think she's making the point about it, it's, it's, it, it's it's one percent. What what? And it's lower than white students. So so all these unqualified black students that go to Harvard, they all graduate. No, they graduate because you can't fail at these places now. So no why are we not presuming fail. white people have the same thing? You, you don't need mediocre white people. All you have all you have to do is so get in. People can be mediocre at every race. Okay, okay, I can okay. tell you that I have watched the referees. All you have to do is get in to the Ivy League schools, and if you show up for class, that you're going to be passed. But when it comes to passing so the bar but, exam and the professional it. schools, the data by um, uh, Richard Sanders and his, uh, do you know the person I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm just trying to get the leap between college graduation and bar exam. Why wouldn't that be the legal education, not the college education? They, because when they, ca well, it's a combination of all of it, affirmative action. That's, that's, so that's, let, a, let that's an, a huge empirical leap to say, to say my college education, then three years later after law school, you're blaming my failure to pass, pass the LSAT or my college degree I, and not my law school education? The, let let the, me you tease get out your, a broader question you get your, here. You get your undergrad degree, right. I would say in an environment often where the standards are lower and minority students at the bottom. And some of the debt, I didn't talk about the, what is $1.9 trillion in student loans that students take out all of these loans. Many of the minority students don't become doctors and lawyers and scientists, and they still are saddled with debt if they don't pass professional exams. Let me ask a so that's actually doing harm to racial and ethnic minorities. Okay. And I think that if you look at the DEI programs, and you're talking about DEI, that to me that's relatively new the way we're doing that's it. The, that's what we're supposed that's to be relative. About. No, but I'm saying that's relatively new. The before DEI, we had affirmative action programs. We had affirmative action offices. The DEI is a billion dollar industry that's on top of affirmative action. Are they adding more than what affirmative action was doing? In the so you'd be okay with just affirmative action? I would be okay with non-discrimination. No, but would you be okay with, because you just suggested that DEI is an unnecessary addition to affirmative I've already, action, I've but already, you actually oppose affirmative already, action. I've already said that affirmative action violated the law, but people tolerated it. But you, it's been around for, what, 50, 60 years? And I think that we are at a new place in, uh, in, our, in American society. We are at a new place, and that we need to think of creative ways to achieve our goals, and I would be willing to accept affirmative action if it was offered on a non-racial basis and it was merit attached to it, and it was not about... So what would make, uh, why would that be affirmative action? Why would it be affirmative action? Yeah, what would make that, that's literally about that. You're saying you'd take affirmative action if it had none of the characteristics of affirmative action. No, what, what are you saying about the... You're it, saying that you would take affirmative action if it weren't based no, on... No, it looked more like... What the Civil Rights Act of 1964 brought about, which was outreach, non-discrimination, and it set up. But a, not based on race and based on. No, race. it would be it would be based on uh, if you wanted to look but who at would I reach out circumstances. To? What about poor whites in Appalachia? So I think let me jump in here because I think what we're getting at is I asked the question about de, uh, about equity, and I'm glad we, it sparked this debate because this is what the the issue is here. You're talking about unintended consequences. You're talking about uh, you know, whether or not you're, you're getting at the right types of people and how do you get the right type of, of environment here. Uh, and the unintended yeah. consequences, number one being uh, you know, tokenism. That was one of the questions I'm gonna, I was going to ask about whether DEI opens the criticism of tokenism. Or the idea, I, I would disagree with you empirically on this. And I, I think Which the, part? I, I'm about to go there. The, the, I, you, you're saying that First, the idea is that unqualified black people end up at Harvard. Not just black, yeah, racial and ethnic minorities, the, right. their scores, they're at the bottom. So, 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 so I'm saying, and that's so, if, if, so no, but let me finish the argument before you disagree. So if we're saying that there are unqualified or underqualified black people or unprepared black people, I'm using black people in particular. Not all black people, some black people I, I, I know. meet the standards. I know, I, if you'd understand, I promise you'll okay. hear my point fully, right. and then again, we can disagree. I just want to make the argument. Um, the point here is that, the idea here is that these black people get to Harvard. I'm using Harvard because that's a Supreme Court case example. And when they get there, they flop because they weren't qualified and that they're sort of positioned beyond their ability. The, the challenge of that argument is the data shows that black students actually drop out or fail out of Harvard less than white, than white students. 
And then your counter to that was, well, that's because once you get there, they just push you on through. I don't disagree that there's great inflation in those places, but there's not a shred of data. And if there is, please, please show it to me. That shows that somehow black people at Harvard are more subjected to great inflation or being pushed through than their white counterparts. If we're assuming that they're taking the same classes and they're having the same teachers, and there's no data to suggest anything to the contrary, then why would we not believe that black people are, we have some mediocre black students, we have some mediocre white students, we have some mediocre Asian students, and some of them get pushed through, and we have a bunch of extraordinary high achievers there, which is the most, the bulk of Harvard, right? Harvard's not filled with mediocre people. Harvard is filled with extraordinary people, just like this institution. And, and, and occasionally you get some people who get in, and they, and they get pushed through. That's absolutely true. Well, we'll make it sound, but there's no data that says that black this. people are Are you concerned at all about the, the fact that college admissions, it's like a zero sum, that if you bring in people based on quotas, and I can tell you from being in the Ivy League that the uh, entering classes are about the same ratio. The, the admissions committee, they decide in advance if it's gonna be you know 11% black and 15% Hispanic and you know 8% uh, Asian. They make those decisions, and it doesn't matter what the applicant pool looks like. It's always the same. And That's not so true. they are That's replacing not true. It, it, it. Do you have any evidence of that? There's plenty of evidence. I don't have it here because we don't have time to present all of that. But you should read my book, uh, The Adversity of Diversity and Other Things. I read your book. That I, can I, I didn't see you. an I, can I, I, I read your book. I didn't see an empirical can, reference to that. Not, not to that, but I can bring well, you other material. No, I evidence. Can bring, I can bring right. you other. So I'm going to I'm 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 call a timeout because we have over 45 questions. I mean, I, I, that we I have, have been from the audience, which is fantastic. Well, well, wait a minute. We have, um, I, I have uh, actually 12 books. And so my book, um, the New White Nationalism in America has five chapters on affirmative action. So I would suggest you read those five chapters on affirmative action because that was one of the issues that people were quite upset about in 2002. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple of these questions. And actually we've been hitting some of the questions that have come in through, uh, through your discussion right now. Um, we got a diversity, equity, and inclusion. Meritocracy. So I think part of what you guys were getting at just now is the question of meritocracy and whether or not we trade, uh, you know, getting kids based in based on merit for, you know, the, you know, check the boxes, whatever you want to call it. Um, is there a way to reintroduce meritocracy and still get at the idea of greater diversity? And, and we've already, I think, established as, as common ground here that diversity is not just skin color and gender, it is actually much more, all of the lived experiences and everything else that makes a unique person. But how do we, are we sacrificing meritocracy, it seems like, in an advance of DEI? I'll let you go. Oh, okay. Uh, no, we're not. I, again, I, the, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a misrepresentation of, this, of the circumstance to suggest that suddenly, like, it's not like they go into a room of black people and say, we need eight of y'all, right? They go into a room of qualified people and say, we need eight blacks. There's a difference. Now, you can have a disagreement with the latter point, but it's not the same thing. They don't say, we just need some black people to fill the quota. We just need some women to fill the quota. We, among the qualified people in the pool, among the qualified people in the pool, we want to ensure that there is diversity among this. And part of the reason for that, again, is because the institutions themselves have a predisposition for selecting people who are like them. That's not just white people. That's not just Christians. That's not just straight people. Everybody has a tendency to pick people who look like them. And it's not just because we're nativistic and, 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 and biased and tribalistic. It's because we develop criteria that seem neutral that actually are based on our own experiences and values and traditions. There's a study by Diva Pager uh, that shows that white men get more job callbacks, white men with felonies get more job callbacks than black men without them, right? It's not because white men write these great job applications, right? Studies show that when you have an ethnic sounding name, you are statistically less likely to get a job callback. With the same resume, meritocracy we're talking about. Uh -huh. I write my resume, Mark Hill, right? Mm -hmm. I got a fighting champ. I throw Lamont in there, they might think I'm French. We, I got a shot. My same friend, Jamal Jenkins, 
That's a black name for you. Jamal Jenkins takes the same resume, sends it in. He's less likely to get a job, job callback because his name is Jamal Jenkins. So the whole point of this is to say that Jamal shouldn't have less of a chance than me. Jamal is as qualified, but historically we've gotten, we've demonstrated that if your name is Jamal Jenkins, you don't even have a chance to get in a room that's equal. And so what would it mean for us to have mechanisms in place to ensure that the Jamal Jenkins get in, the, the Jamal Jenkinses of the world get into the room? That's all we're asking for. Barrett, this, these systems are not designed to get unqualified people in the room. They're saying that we need to diversify the people in the room who are already qualified. Now tell me why I'm wrong. It's, it, it would take me <laughs> a long time to tell you uh, where you're wrong, but I can tell you that uh, a merit-based system may not yield the kind of quotas that we've had in the past where you're trying to get a certain number of minorities. And I find that people that do say that they have diversity or they want diversity, when you actually look, they, their diversity is concentrated in black studies, it's concentrated now in the DEI layer, it's concentrated in certain silos, uh, it's not uh, across uh, every department. And I think that there is a problem that has to do with lowered standards and lowered expectations. And one of the reasons why minorities fare worse sometimes based on their names and that type of thing, it has to do with the culture, the crime rate, just so many different factors that, um, that black people that associate with blacks uh, in people's minds. And some of it is just the attitude and just the things that you see. You see all the time, um, the, the violence. I mean, it's just all of these factors play into how black people fare in America. Yeah. It, it sounds like you're saying what I'm saying, right? My, my point was Jamal don't get the call back because of racism. And you're saying, saying that this. Jamal don't get the call back because they think he might be violent because he's black. That sounds like racism. Because stati statistics would show that if you were going by probabilities, uh, if you were just judging people by the probabilities, of crime, then um, people using that kind of data would be more apprehensive when it comes to a black person. Do you think that's and fair? It may not be fair, but that's how the world operates. Exactly. So we're in agreement. The world operates in a way that's but not mean, fair. But DEI, diversity. <laughs> the basis of race. That's, a, that's, a, that's, like, no, that's what, a real jujitsu way of saying this racism. How does diversity, equity, and inclusion have really anything to do with that? Because it's diversity, yeah, because all of these programs are relatively new. This whole industry that's on top of affirmative action. And you say, is it too new to judge, though? It's relatively new, and you talk, but is it too new to, too and new you to judge? And you talked about the, yeah, we, yeah. Then why are you trying failing. to abolish it? It's failing. Then why are you trying to abolish it's it? It's failing. It's failing. It's not effective. And you talked about the corporations that gave so much money to DEI programs. They are pulling back because, you know, pretty much they got rolled. Look at uh, Black Lives Matter that got millions and millions of dollars. And what did the leaders do? They bought houses. And uh, you look at Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote the, uh, the book. And you know he's known for the anti-racism. And uh, th the money that was given to him from all sorts of corporations, that money is gone. And so That's why should true. corporations? That's what do you mean it's not true? Well, we That's don't know where the money is. It's not is gone. The problem is that it was, the problem is that it, it, the, the critique of him isn't that it's gone. The, and, and I, I, I mean, would you, you, in a public space, I don't want to imply that this man has stolen money when even the- I'm not saying he's stolen money, you're that saying it's money missing. was misused, misused, misappropriated. And what I'm saying is it's not gone. The money's actually much no, of it. No, it's spent. It's so, not spent. That's the point. So, look, but, let's, okay, let's say the hero there. But, the nitty-gritty of... Well, no, but we can't publicly... I don't want to publicly suggest it, or, or get you sued by saying that, he, that, that, that $43 okay, million... I don't want to get... I definitely don't the $43 million dollars isn't gone. The issue is that he got grant money and he didn't fulfill the let's, research let's pull it away uh, from a, a lie to the grant. Example. Yeah. I think um, honing in, and I know we're, we're getting short and there's still lots of questions coming in, yeah. but a couple of the questions touched on, okay, so if... It, is there a way to do it better? You talk about doing it better rather than abolishing it. Are there uh, good, I've got questions around, are there good examples where you've seen there be value in DEI initiatives? And, and I'll kick that to you as well, Dr. Swain, if there is anything redeemable that you see or if it's entirely not redeemable. But I'll start with you, Dr. Hill, oh. Mark. So, and this connects to the point you just made. For me, again, yes, 
to be clear. The answer is yes, it's absolutely redeemable. But if we begin from a place of, of saying that these programs are, I'm sorry, that, that the, the circumstances that precede these programs are, um, do have in, are marked by injustice, that, that people do get a bad way to go, that people are uh, stereotyped and misjudged, right? The point, you ask the question, how does DEI repair that? The answer to me is how you do it better. It's not, the answer to that isn't just to give Jamal the job, right? Because you say that, I agree, that wouldn't necessarily be DEI. That would just be, could be virtue signaling. We have three Jamals here, look at us, put them on the website, right? That's not what I'm talking about. But often that's what liberalism does. It pats itself on the back for just having black people in the room. I am not, I would not disagree with that, that assessment and I would disagree with that practice. I think we both would agree with this. I think we both would be in the same position on that. My point is, part of what DEI training is to do is to teach people that, yeah, Mark Lamont Hill applies to this professor position and his name is Mark Lamont Hill and then Jamal Jenkins applies to the same professor position to teach people how to read applications or to get people to be reflective of their biases so they don't assume that the guy applying for a senior anthropology position at an Ivy League university might be prone to violence. Right, like, like maybe the, Dr. Jenkins might also not whoop some ass in, in the faculty meeting, you know what I mean, with a PhD in, in 20 years of experience, right? That might be a reasonable assessment, but we, we, we all smuggle in our biases. DEI is partly about training that. It's not, it's a, it's a DEI is, 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 is a commitment to a particular type of organizational culture. Well, I thought that was affirmative action because they actually do the, re, re, the, the recruitment. This is, this is, I think, where I find, I, I, I wouldn't say disingenuous, but I, I see a contradiction here. It seems, your argument almost seems to be, we don't need DEI because we have affirmative action, which would be a reasonable argument if you weren't in everything you've ever written committed to eliminating affirmative action. Yeah, the th yeah and I still believe that affirmative action violates the Constitution, Equal Protection Clause, so, and that if we so why had pretend that DEI is un, is unnecessary because of affirmative no, but, action? Well, what I'm what my position my position is that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that we got that right that we got that right in the 1960s when we passed three Civil Rights Acts. Mm -hmm. Out of that became out of that came efforts to become more diverse, but that consisted of outreach, uh, recruitment. And you can call it affirmative action, but those things were taking place, advertising jobs, sending recruiters from industries into colleges and universities that may have been historically black or going into... But you oppose that too. No, I don't oppose that. You said that, you can't do it outreach. based on race. You said you can't do it on race. That's, that's outreach. That's outreach. That's outreach. And so... So the, you can target black groups for outreach. The 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed to address the past and present effects of discrimination. So it was passed to end discrimination and to provide some kind of remedy for the people who had been harmed. And so out of that, there was outreach, there was education, there were, there were efforts at compliance, there was monitoring. Affirmative action was added on top of that as a series of executive orders, not through the law. And the affirmative action uh, became more and more aggressive, I would say, but affirmative action did follow the law in certain ways. DEI does not. And DEI has uh, programs at certain colleges, universities, and industries. Some of the things that have been reported and seen are, are total violations of people's equal protection clause, equal protections. Under can, can I ask a clarifying question? The affirmative action has been ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, correct? Yeah, in college admissions. You're, what you're, say, you're, you're saying in the same breath that I'm saying the DEI is, is, should be. Should be, and I, that's the distinction I want to make. It, 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 the courts have not determined this. This is Dr. Swain saying that, not the courts. Yeah, yeah my book uh, makes the argument yes. that DEI programs and critical race theory and sensitivity training, that that should be eliminated on the same grounds because they violate the Constitution. Uh, in the same way well, and why do you civil rights training? I'm, just, I'm genuinely curious. Because there have been many reports of trainings where all the white people were told to be quiet, uh, that they had nothing to say, uh, and they were berated. Uh, or men, like one of the things that the Civil Rights Act protects, it's men as well as females. We, we focus on the discrimination against women, 
But now there's discrimination against men. There's discrimination against heterosexuals. There's discrimination against Christians uh, uh, through the DEI program. So many of the DEI programs. Oh, so oh I'm sorry. I misunderstood race. what you were saying. I misunderstood so what you were saying. So it's not, about, not just about race, but I'm going back to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and its uh, intentions was to prohibit group-based discrimination. And it was not to bring about a reverse discrimination where men would be discriminated against rather than women or, or heterosexuals rather than homosexuals or blacks or, uh, or whites. The, the ideal was to end discrimination. And if we focus on people as individuals, we evaluate them as individuals rather than bringing them in as members of groups, I think we get to the society that we're trying to uh, create. So I think, I think the I'm challenge. To wrap it up. So okay. the, let this be your final thoughts. Okay, I, I think the challenge of that approach to say, well, we'll 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 train you as individuals and engage you as individuals in training, when but we have our judgments about people collectively, right? So you just yourself talked about how black communities are, how black people are. I find and I, I find black communities have problems that have to be addressed by black people. Dr. Swain, let's let, let him finish. So, so, so again, black communities have problems. They need to be addressed by black people. You're making a collective argument about black people. You're not treating them like individuals. Mm -hmm. And this is often a problem that I see, particularly from, from, from many of the critiques coming from the right of these issues, right? Is they say, we shouldn't talk about race. We shouldn't talk about race. We shouldn't talk about race. There's a problem in the black community. There's fatherless in the black community. There's crime in the black community. Black women do this. You know, the, the, the LGBTQ movement does this. So we talk about people in the arrogance to pathologize them, but when it's time to redress the harm, we suddenly want to be individuals. And I think we can't sort of be socialist when it comes to, to criticizing and, and free market fundamentalists and rugged individualists when it comes to healing people. So that, that becomes part of sort of my, my issue with the way we frame the whole thing. And again, I think if I, your argument for, well, these trainings have been done poorly, Maybe some of them have. And I've seen some of the more egregious examples of that. Just like people talk about critical race theory or these other classroom interventions where we, we'll, we'll take two moments out of like 10,000 and say these are awful. I don't disagree that those are awful. I find that most examples we cherry pick are awful. But again, that's not an argument for not doing it. It's an argument for doing it better. It's an argument for doing it well. It's an argument for creating new mechanisms. But, if, but every point you've made has been about pointing out the ways that these things aren't as good as they could be. So all I'm saying is, rather than abolish these, these mechanisms, let's find new ways of improving them. Going into, a, and this is the last thing I'll say, going into a room and saying, we need to be more sensitive. Uh, we need to be conscious of our biases. We need to be conscious of the language that we use. I don't see anything wrong with that. That doesn't mean that I want to police free speech, right? But if, um, I mean, we just had one of, the most horrific scenes of violence, in fact, maybe the most, I, you know, I'm thinking about Ukraine, I'm thinking about other things, but one of the most horrific scenes of violence, over a thousand people were murdered last weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That has a profound impact on people in this institution, how we talk about people, how we think about people. I wouldn't dare tell a group of Jewish students that wanted to huddle up and have a meeting or have support to talk about this awful atrocity, this massacre that just happened. I wouldn't say to them, well, we can't do that because we, that's, that's a homogeneous group. And I wouldn't dare tell a university administrator who wants to be, who wants the student body to be conscious of the ways that anti-Semitic language can be used unintentionally against students, against Jewish students. I wouldn't dare say, well, we don't do sensitivity training. And I, wouldn't, and I definitely wouldn't say, well, this is, this, is, uh, this, this is an act of harm against Christians or act of harm against Gentiles. I wouldn't say that. Because we don't live in a world where everybody starts in the same place. We live in a world where harm is constantly being committed. All of us do it, and we have to figure out how to do it better. Not the harm, but the, but, but the togetherness. We need to figure out how to do us better, how to do community better, how to do institutions better. And we can't do that unless we're intentional and direct. And yes, we can do it better, but you don't throw I don't want to use that metaphor because I think that would, that would cause harm. But we don't throw everything out with the stuff we don't want. See what I did there? Dr. Thank you. Swain. Well, I guess I would go back to the Constitution. And as far as the, uh, the groups, people huddling together, 
for freedom of association, if you give people freedom of association, they should be able to associate it with either like-minded people or people that are part of their group. I don't think institutional resources should necessarily encourage segregation when you're trying to integrate and bring people in and have diversity where they can learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And so that's my uh, position on that. And um, I believe that when the nation's motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one, that that's what we should be striving towards. And I don't see how diversity, equity, and inclusion programs bring us closer to that because the diversity that's being pushed now really is group diversity. It's not about bringing in individuals and allowing them to be individuals. And uh, the uh, affinity groups that are set up sometimes on campuses, sometimes on the job, uh, these uh, groups are dividing people. When you think about a job and the mission of a job, institutions have missions, colleges, it's educational, jobs, uh, there's some mission for every organization. The ideal is to have healthy teams where people come together as talented individuals. And I maintain that we can have diversity without discrimination. I believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, programs and uh, as they are being instituted today, whether it's the workplace or on campuses, that they divide, that they don't bring people together, they don't um, take us where we should be going. And so what I see uh, is tribalism, and my hope would be that we would, we would unite around the ideals of our organizations or our values, if you're Christians, there are certain things that you believe as Christians, and dividing people based on the group attributes is not ideal. So ideally, um, if we wanted to strive for a better society, we would focus on bringing people together across various lines. We would not be pitting you know, men against women, heterosexuals against homosexuals, blacks against whites, or various other groups, men against women. Uh, the ideal is to bring people together. DEI, in my opinion, is about dividing. Wow. Let's put our hands together for these two speakers. Come, 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 come. Mark is looking up because I think we all want to see the big question. But before we put up the final results, I'm going to give you like 30 seconds to get your to take the poll. If you have not had a chance to take your poll, we'd love to know. Did your position change? It's everybody. So you already did the pre-poll. We're giving you a few, uh, a minute or two just to take the post-poll, and then we're going to put up the, the results to see if people have changed. So it's the same Q QR code that you have in front of you. You can do that. You can only go up. <laughs> <laughs> he can only go up. I'm playing with house money, man. I only had like 10, 19%. Okay, let's see. Okay. All right. Well, let's see what we've got. It's about the same, but actually, the agreement category went down from 63% to 61%. Uh, <laughs> the disagree went down as well from 28% to 26%, and now we have a whole lot more confused people. Uh, I'll take it. From 9 to 13. <laughs> can be. It's okay to be undecided. It's okay to be undecided. Issues. I think we accomplished the goals, the two goals tonight. You saw how to debate passionately but civilly, and then you also heard something that you didn't hear before, which obviously dem is demonstrated by that 13%, that, um, that increase in the undecided. So thank you so much to our, our guests, our speakers here. Thank okay. you all for listening. And Jennifer, I'll turn it Actually, to you. you. Not to Al Gore this, but can we check the polls one more time? It, it appears that mine is going up. Are you getting sympathy? Oh, it is going up. But I was sympathy. We both had the same time. But so, so did the uh, undecided. <laughs> yeah, so the only thing that went down was yours. Well, I mean, I was so high, I could only go down. Fair enough. Yeah. But Let's give another great.